Soaring, Not Stumbling, Preventing and Teaching Struggling Readers and Spellers. The United States is facing a literacy crisis. A majority of our students today are struggling with reading. 68% of students in the eighth grade nationwide are struggling with reading. They read below proficiency. 34% read below basic. They are functionally illiterate. And only 32% of the nation's fourth graders are reading well. These statistics remain fairly consistent into the eighth grade. 68% of students continue to struggle with reading and spelling in the eighth grade and read below proficient, while the same 32% of students continue to read well. Yet reading is the foundation of all of education, and the type of education that we can build for a student really depends on how well we build the foundation for reading. If we have a shallow or a, not a very deep foundation, it limits the structure that we can build in the student's education. However, when students learn to read well, when they understand words, when they understand how words are built uh, and how language works, and they have a deep foundation in reading, they are to build, able to build a skyscraper of an education. The opportunities that are before them are limitless, and they will be able to pursue their dreams. Now, many students today, as we talked about, those struggle with the foundation of education, which is reading. And this presentation will help us to understand why are so many students today struggling? What are some of the problems that they are facing as they are learning to read? And what are some simple solutions that we can um, use to help these students to master the basic skills of reading? Before we begin, though, we need to really set the stage because English is one of the most difficult written codes to master. English is a complex language. There are 74 basic phonograms that represent the sounds of English. There are um, 23 of these phonograms which make more than one sound. English also is a multicultural language. It takes vocabulary from other languages and we're able to import those into English. Vowels are very difficult in English. We have a lot of vowels and they shift. The sounds of them shift with uh, the accent, which accent, which syllable is accented, and they shift with dialects. In addition to the complexity of English, English is a massive language. There are thought to be over two million words in English and the language continues to grow. There are new words added to the language probably on a daily basis. It is the largest language in terms of vocabulary in the um, history of the world. So learning how to read in English is a daunting task. What I want to talk about is how do we teach this massive subject and prevent confusion and discouragement? How do we understand the elements and the components that are confusing our students and what are those solutions? The first reason many students struggle with reading and spelling is a misunderstanding about the print to speech connection. This is not surprising because many of our reading curriculums use a confusing way to teach. They begin by teaching students first uh, words, words oftentimes from the Dolch list. Students are asked to memorize that these symbols on the page represent words. Then many of these programs move to syllables. And so then students are thinking, wait, the symbols on the page are not words, they're syllables. And then many programs will move to phonetics. Or they'll mix all three of these approaches together, creating confusion for the students. What are the symbols representing at their most elemental, uh, elementary level? What I'm going to propose is that we really need to begin by teaching students phonograms. Now, the term phonogram means literally sound picture. Phono means sound and gram means picture. So a phonogram is a picture of a sound. I don't teach letters I, to students. I don't teach them that these are the letters because um, that's an oversimplification of the language. Um, for example, this is a picture of the sounds a, a, a. It also happens to be the letter a. But this is a picture of the sound oi. Now notice the sound oi is written with two letters. This is a picture of the sound i. Notice this um, particular spelling of the sound i is written with three letters. And this is a picture of the sound a written with four letters. So a phonogram can use one, two, three, or four letters to represent the sound. Also phonograms can make more than one sound and it's important that students understand that right from the beginning about English.
One of the mistakes that uh, many curriculum developers make when trying to teach students the phonetic code is they pair pictures with the phonograms or with the letters. And you can see immediately that this creates some problems because when you pair a, pi a picture of an apple with the letter A, you give the impression that the A only says one sound as an apple. But A actually says three sounds. It says A as an apple, A as an age, and on as in water. And students, when they learn that A says A and only says A, will then go out and they will immediately begin finding words where it doesn't say A. And you're going to need to tell the students that's an exception or that's something you'll learn later in the year or that's something you'll learn in first grade. And um, in the case of many programs, um, for example, the phonics program I used when I was teaching my boys to read, I the program taught that A said A as an apple in kindergarten. It taught that A said A as an age and in first grade, and it never taught that A says A ah as in water and ma and pa, and all of those words became sight words unnecessarily. Many programs also become a little more sophisticated about this pairing of letters uh, with pictures. And so you'll see that um, programs who try to make it cute like this with the A with uh, in um, imposed over the apple. And in this case, they're really creating an indirect memory link with the phonogram because the student is supposed to think, okay, that's an A. It looks like an apple, so I'll have to segment off the first sound. Apple starts with an A, therefore that says A. And what we really want instead is for students to look at the phonogram and say that says three sounds, A, 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 instantaneously. This is one place where students really need to master this material for instant recognition. Um, these phonograms and their sounds are the foundation of all of reading and all of um, education is really built off of it. It's also important that we begin by teaching students lowercase letters. So often um, in the United States, for some reason, we began by teaching students uppercase letters. We have this uh, misconception that because they're uppercase, they're easier for students. But when do we use uppercase letters? We only use them at the beginning of sentences and the beginning of proper nouns. You know, 95, 96, 97, I don't know, percent of the letters that we read are lowercase. We really need to begin with students by teaching them the lowercase letters. You also see a lot of confusion about upper and lowercase um, letters with um, younger students because they will mix in upper and lowercase all over the place because they don't know where they're used. I prefer to teach all the lowercase letters first and then some of the phonogram, multi-letter phonograms, and all of their sounds and then go back and to teach the uppercase letters. And when we teach uppercase letters, we teach when they're used. They're used at the, prop, uh, at the beginning of a proper noun. They're used at the beginning of a sentence. And so students know immediately the purpose for these uppercase letters. It's also important that we teach um, students the sounds of the phonograms and not the letter names. Too often we begin by teaching students that this is a D-O-G. But DOG does nothing to tell students how to read the word d -a -g, dog. Rather, it's the sounds that are used to read words. And so we need to begin with students with sounds. In fact, many students are really confused about phonograms or about the letters because they think that the letters are DOG and that doesn't help them with reading. And they're a little unclear with how the sounds play out. In fact, one older gentleman um, shared with me that he has all his life struggled with reading. Uh, he was actually an engineer. And he said, I struggled with reading all my life. And it wasn't until I read Uncovering the Logic of English that I understood that those letters and those phonograms were representing sounds. My teacher had said that, but they spent so much time talking about names that I didn't understand that the sounds were important. And so don't um, uh, make assumptions that your students are going to understand that the sounds are the key when we, uh, if you emphasize letter names over sounds in your classrooms and in your homes. Now, I'm not saying to go to extremes. It is important to teach the letter names. Otherwise, you'll have students do what my sons did and read the eye chart as eh, e, f, and p when they go to the eye doctor. So my suggestion for you is to actually teach uh, the sounds first. 
of the lowercase letters. And then to go back after they know A through Z and a few multi-letter phonograms, then to go back and teach the multi or to teach the capital letters. And at that time, teach the letter names and teach the students how to match the uppercase and the lowercase letters together. And they'll learn then the names as well. Another reason that many students struggle with reading and with spelling is exceptions. You know, we teach English in such a way that students are told that everything is an exception. In fact, often when a student has a valid question about words, rather than saying to them, I don't know the answer, I will look it up, we tell them that's an exception. English is crazy. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. You're going to have to memorize it. And this creates an enormous problem for students. I have just one example uh, that I'd like to share in this presentation about this. Uh, one of the most common exceptions that we tell students is that have does not say have and give does not say give because these are exceptions. You know, we usually teach the rule, the vowel says its name because of the E, and then when students misread these words, we say that's an exception. But the rule actually is that English words don't end in V. And if we just told students, every time you hear a V at the end of a word, you need to add a silent final E, it would clear up thousands of exceptions. In fact, this list that you see on your screen goes from A through D of words ending in a V. Uh, followed by a silent final E. And so when students are not taught all the rules, they often generate thousands and thousands of exceptions and a great deal of confusion. This is another example. Uh, the phonics program that I used to teach uh, early on said that this says the sound s, as in sand, sick, list, and hiss, which it does. And then my boys, who are little engineers um, in the making, read is as is and his as hiss and was as was and on and on. Now, I was trained as a teacher. I was trained to teach English as a second language. And in my reading methods classes, I was told that these are sight words. And so as that year progressed, I thought, these boys aren't learning their sight words. What's wrong? And then it began to dawn on me, um, and I began to understand, S actually says two sounds. Now, these are related sounds. If you say the sound S and Z with me for a moment, I want you to pay attention to how your mouth is forming the sounds. What is the same and what is different? So go ahead. S, Z. Now you'll notice your mouth is in the same position, but why do they sound different? If you place your hand on your throat while you say s and z, you'll notice that one is voiced and one is unvoiced. Your voice box turns on when you say z and it's off when it says s. So this is a voiced and unvoiced pair. And my, uh, you know, four or five year old children um, who were these little engineers noticed th that difference early on. Now, my theory is that some students don't notice the difference. And when we say, if when they misread is as is, and we say, honey, that's an exception. It says is. The approximation is enough and they're able to intuit it and go on. I remember learning this phonogram in school and I learned that it says ch as in chin, champion, and chapel. And then I also remember learning to write the word school and thinking that says stool and English is stupid. And it also says k is in character and k is in scholar. CH also says a third sound, sh is in chef, Chicago, and machine. So really this phonogram says three sounds. It says ch, k, and sh. And we would clear up a tremendous amount of confusion right from the beginning if we simply told the students all the sounds. It's also important to realize uh, in the spelling bees, I don't know if any of you have watched the script spelling bees on television, but those students are not rotely memorizing all the information for spelling. Rather, they're allowed to ask the moderator a question about origins. And when they hear that the word uh, has the k sound in it, as in school and character and scholar, they know that, uh, and they ask the moderator what is the origin, and the moderator says it's Greek, they know it's spelled with a ch. And when the moderator says that there's a, um, that it's a French word and they hear the sh sound in it, they know that it's spelled with a CH as well because CH is the French spelling of the sound sh as in chef, Chicago, and machine. So it's important that we understand that there are two different types of students. Now, these aren't your traditional learning styles. This is something that I've observed, but there are logical, literal students. These are our nation's future engineers and scientists. These students, um, 
really understand and hear the differences in language very early on. And they're going to test out what you tell them about language. If you tell them that S says S, they're going to test it again and again and again to prove that that's correct or to prove that it's incorrect. Our intuitive students are able to flex and flow um, with information a little bit more than our logical literal students, and they have a gift as well. But we need to teach in a way that doesn't frustrate our logical literal students, that doesn't frustrate our nation's future engineers and scientists and mathematicians. And when we teach our intuitive students how the language works, they tend to just go faster and, and all the farther. So uh, the solution uh, to students having confusion about the language is to teach students the 74 phonograms and 30 spelling rules, which logically explain 98% of English words. It's also to teach them all the sounds and reliable rules right from the beginning. Another reason that many students struggle with reading and with learning to spell is sight words. Sight words are really an exercise in rote memory. I love this picture because here's this gentleman drilling the word have and you can just picture this little boy misreading it again and again as have and you know neither of them look very happy and I know that this uh, sort of problem is happening around our nation every day in school as those as students are learning those dolch words because we're not teaching them how the language works and now you know that if we had just simply told this boy that the English words don't end in V the silent E is there to prevent the V from being at the end, he would be able to sound out this word and it wouldn't need to be a sight word. In addition, um, research out of the University of Florida has shown that the human memory is limited to about 2,000 sight sound symbols. So when we teach reading by using the whole word approach, we really are limiting students. In fact, many students who are functionally illiterate know about 2,000 sight words. They've really succeeded at the task given, and yet they cannot read a newspaper and obtain meaning. Um, to put it into perspective, too, the average adult knows about 60,000 words and has about 60,000 words in their vocabulary. So to memorize 60,000 words by rote would be like having a stack of flashcards that was as tall as a seven-story building. That amount of memory work is ridiculous. Instead, we need to teach students how to understand the language so that they can read and decode new words and any word that they come across. Um, it's also important to understand that when we teach sight words, many students become confused and they believe that the symbols on the page represent words and not sounds. They begin to guess about words. Now, the solution to this is phonemic awareness. Students who lack phonemic awareness often appear to be guessing wildly when they're reading. Now, I don't know if you've encountered this, but many students as they're reading along will read and then they'll say a word and you'll think, where on earth did you get that? And they pull it out of no place. In fact, um, some students are so good at guessing and so good at context that they can sometimes trick you into believing that they know how to read because they're able to look at the pictures, they're able to, um, they have a few sight words and they're able to to appear as if they can read, even if they can't. So what is the solution? The solution is learning to glue words together and how to unglue words. Now here's what I mean. There's a lot of games that we can play with students to build phonemic awareness. One of the ones I like to do is to have a scavenger hunt. And I'll say to students, I'm going to unglue a word. Now notice I'm going to do this auditorily. You won't need the students don't need to know the uh, phonograms or the rep uh, written representations of these sounds at all. But I'll say, I'm going to unglue a word. I want you to glue it back together and run around and find the object that I'm saying. So I'm going to say sp, ooh, n. And the students will need to run and find a spoon. They'll need to glue it, glue it back together, spoon. Or I'll say, how about a k o t, coat? And they'll need to run and find a coat. You can also do this with Simon Says, which is really fun. You can say, I'm going to say an action, and I want you to um, glue it back together and do the action. S, it, sit, st, a, n, d, stand, j, a, m, p, jump. And the students then can glue back the words um, and do the action. With older students, you can have a choose the picture game where you lay out some pictures or objects on a table and you say, I'm going to include the word. I want you to choose the correct one. This is really the beginning 
of reading, being able to take words, break them into their individual sounds, and glue them back together. Um, the reverse is for spelling. Students can take a word and, and break it into its sounds. So you say, I have a bunch of objects on the table, now I want you to unglue the sounds, and I'll choose the correct one. Many students also struggle with reading um, and sometimes spelling or writing because of confused directionality and reversals. These students will write their B's and P's, or B's and D's backwards, their P's and Q's, they'll get reversed. Many of these students are not strong visual learners and uh, they will write them backwards. They'll even read them backwards within a text. So these students struggle with um, orienting images correctly in their mind or um, memorizing the shapes of these images. So this has to do with the fact that reading has a component of visual muscle memory. The eyes must learn to move in the direction of reading and writing in order to become fluent readers. Uh, you'll notice that many students, when they're trying to read, well, sometimes it'll seem like they keep looking at the pictures. Now, this can be because they're trying to guess. They're coming across lots of words they don't know, and they're trying to guess. But it also can be because that those um, images on the page are designed to be the strongest visual element on the page. If you're a graphics designer, you know that even the images have a focal point and that you want the eye to travel to a particular place in that image. Well, if you put images on the page and then words, those images are stronger um, visual elements and will pull the eyes to those images, even subconsciously. And so I know I have done this with some struggling um, my students when they were struggling with reading, I would tell them, oh, stop, stop looking at the pictures, focus, pay attention. And I thought it was an attention issue when I began to realize it's really a muscle memory issue. And a very, very simple solution to this is to be able to take a blank piece of paper, place it over those images on the page and say, okay, now you can read um, the words. And then when you get to the next page, say, okay, you can look to, at the pictures all you want. When you're ready, place the um, picture or the blank page over the pictures and then we'll read the words. If needed, you can also take a second piece of paper and cover the words at the bottom of the page so that you have only one line showing to help train the eye to see the correct line of text that it needs to. I know with my uh, one of my sons who really struggled with reading, he used to go and get the bl blank piece of paper when reading a book until his eyes had developed the visual muscle memory to read in the direction of reading and writing, which in English is left to write. Um, we need to understand that visual muscle memory of the eyes is much like learning to play an instrument. You would never expect that a student would be able to sit down and play the piano without practicing the motions and developing the muscle memory. And so it is with the eyes. It's also important to understand if you're a musician, you know that if you practice something incorrectly, so if you practice a piece and you develop the wrong muscle memory, it's almost impossible to overcome. Well, in the same way, uh, many students practice the visual muscle memory of reading incorrectly because we use reading strategies to teach children how to read rather than teaching them how to decode the word within the word. Instead, um, you know, my actually my local school recently sent out to their vol reading volunteers a handout that said that if a student misses a word, have them go back and reread the sentence. If they miss it again, help them have them go back and reread the paragraph. If they miss it again, have them look at the pictures. They uh, try to guess from context. And when we do this, we're actually training the eye to jump around the page looking for clues. And we're training students to guess. So we wonder why they're guessing, but we're training them to guess. Instead, we need to teach students to look at the word in the direction of reading and writing, to see the phonograms, and then to sound out the word and what it says. It's also important to stand or sit in front of the student. Um, this means a more traditional classroom setting, especially for young students who are emerging readers and emerging spellers, or for students who are struggling with reading and spelling. Because I teach classes um, on literacy development and because I train many teachers and many parents, I have had adults who have come to me who have dyslexia or who have um, issues with visual muscle memory and who tell me that even sitting at a right angle to the board is very difficult for them to translate 
sunlight. And so it's important that students have a straight on view of the teaching that is happening in the room. If you're tutoring a student or working in a homeschool setting, I like to sit in the um, front of the student, maybe across the table. And if I'm giving demonstrations, I might have a small whiteboard that I hold up on my left hand side and then write on it in order to help the students um, under, uh, be able to sit in front of me. It's also important that we do everything in the direction of reading and writing. When we uh, cross our T's on the board, do it um, from right to left. Don't go backwards. Uh, when we erase the board, you can erase from right to left because students' eyes will um, subconsciously follow you as you do these actions and they'll be practicing visual muscle memory in those directions. You can also, when reading aloud to students, follow the text with your finger. Now, you don't want to do this for the entire hour or half hour that you read aloud, but for the first few minutes, the student's eyes will naturally follow as you're reading along, and it will give them practice in the visual muscle memory of right to left. Now, I like this image because many of us um, do homework where students are sitting across the table. Many of our classrooms are actually oriented with students sitting across the table these days. But when students sit across the table from each other, they are seeing texts upside down. And this can be a real problem because students without good visual muscle memory will be seeing the text right side up and upside down all at the same time. And many of those students will become confused about which direction those letters and those phonograms are oriented. So until a student has really become a strong reader, I recommend not having students sit up um, across from one another because it can really um, create a lot more reversals and a lot more visual confusion. I also recommend that we do not assign copy work um, to a child before they can read at least at a second grade level. Before that, it's artwork. Students are just copying the letters. They're copying the words on the page, but they're not really understanding them. And children with visual um, muscle memory issues will have a lot of reversals in this sort of work, and they will be generating more confusion than um, it will be helping them. I don't know if you've seen this before too. Some students, instead of reading the cat is on the mat, will read the catty sun them at. And so what they're doing here is they're taking the beginning of one word and attaching it to the end. These students are confused about where words begin and end. And many students too will do this in their writing. They'll put too much space between the letters and words and too little space between words because some of the times those students are confused about what the spaces are for and where words begin and end. Now the solution for visual confusion, um, one of the best solutions is to teach cursive. And I know this can be really surprising to people, but I'd really like to go through some of the reasons that it's good to begin um, handwriting instruction with cursive and why it's good to take a struggling student, uh, older student who's struggling with reading and to switch them to cursive. Um, first of all, it's very difficult to reverse B and D and P and Q in cursive. Also, you'll notice all the words are connected, and so it emphasizes where words begin and end. And in fact, this is also important from a muscle memory standpoint. And this is one of the reasons it's really good to start students right in kindergarten with cursive. Though I know that not all schools are going to switch and not all parents are going to switch their children. If you take a moment and write the word teacher in um, manuscript and then in cursive and really pay attention to the muscle memory, you'll notice that in manuscript you have to keep lifting up your pencil in order to form the words. And it actually, in manuscript, requires far more muscle memory, far more fine motor skills than in cursive, where all the words are connected and you only lift up your pencil between words. In addition, all the cursive letters begin on the baseline, so we don't need to tell students where those lowercase cursive letters begin. They all begin in the same place on the baseline. Whereas um, manuscript letters begin in eight different places. So every time we teach a student how to form a manuscript letter, we also need to teach them where that letter begins and they need to be lifting up their pencil between them. Now, historically, cursive was taught first until the 1940s in the United States. In fact, my grandfather, who has maybe a sixth grade education, has beautiful, perfect cursive handwriting. And um, he actually struggled a bit more with print because he was taught cursive right from the very beginning. Um, 
the change in how we taught handwriting actually occurred at the same time that we brought in those sight words and we began to teach uh, using Dick and Jane and teaching students whole words as opposed to how the language actually works. Now, this may surprise you, but a lot of the European countries and most of the world still begins with cursive. And in fact, they begin with cursive and they like to emphasize cursive for their children. And so many of those countries also um, print some of their children's books in cursive in order to emphasize um, for students the value of cursive handwriting. Now, I also want to share that these students learn to read in uh, book face as well as cursive right at the same time. Most people worry that if their students are learning cursive that they won't learn how to read in uh, the book face fonts as well. But I can assure you that that is not as great of a problem as um, the problems generated and the confusion with reversals and the increased um, fine motor skill needed um, by starting with manuscript. Cursive is the type of writing designed for the human hand. Printing was designed for the printing press. And I could really see this with many of the students I've tutored. In fact, just this last year, I tutored a young um, boy who was about 12 years old who was really struggling with reading. And his um, foster mom had taught him cursive at home um, based on my recommendation. And when he came to class the first time, he began to write and print. And his print looked like that of maybe a kindergarten or a first grader. And there was so many issues with it. And so I asked him, could you write these words again in, in, in cursive? And he wrote in beautiful, perfect cursive. And I know she hadn't spent a huge amount of time um, teaching him that. But the, the transition to cursive was so tremendous in legibility and in ease in handwriting. And it's very helpful for students in reinforcing good reading skills. Just a few tips if you're going to teach cursive, begin with large motor skill. Um, even for older students, begin with um, movements that begin at the elbow and do not trace because most of the handwriting programs out there are really tracing programs. They have the little dots and as students do that, they have shown with um, computers that are recording their motions, rather than memorizing the muscle memory to form each of those letters, they're actually tracing and going from like dot to dot to dot. So if you want to learn more about handwriting instruction, you can check out the handwriting instruction video uh, found on the Logic of English website. Another reason many students struggle with uh, reading and spelling education is a lack of regular and consistent practice. We really need to teach reading to mastery. Now, I like to give this analogy. When a student is or a child is learning to ride a tricycle, and you know they have their training wheels on and they're tottering along, we would never go, wow, you've got it. You're ready for a unicycle. No, and yet this is how we teach reading. We tell students, wow, you're old enough to read. You know a couple letters, it's time to read a book. And we set them up for failure by not teaching them how the language really works and not giving them enough practice with uh, the area, with the parts that they need mastery and the phonograms and the rules and blending. So learning is really repetition over time. There are depths to learning. Um, I learned this from my piano teacher, but there's really, we can know something and then we can know something and then we can really know it and have mastered it for life. With reading education, um, the easiest thing to do is to be able to, for example, lay out some phonograms on the table and say to the student, um, I'm going to say a sound and I want you to choose which one I'm reading to you. So it's like a multiple choice. That's the easiest depth of learning. And notice that's mostly how we test our students these days, multiple choice. The second depth of learning when it comes to reading instruction and spelling instruction would be for the students to be able to read the phonograms. And there they have to remember the sounds and have the visual cue and remember the sounds. The most difficult depth of learning in regards to the phonograms would be to hear the phonogram and be able to write it without a visual cue. Here they're needing to hear and then recognize and reproduce the shape on their own. The same is true for uh, reading and spelling. Students who can read a word um, don't necessarily know how to spell it. They know the word, but they haven't really mastered it. Students who have mastered a word to the level that they can spell it um, know that word more deeply. And students who can spell a word always know how to read it. Now, when we talk about um, practice 
and repetition and learning being repetition over time, we need to understand that this is not, um, doesn't, should not be boring. Rather, it should be fun. Um, learning to read and learning to spell and learning the phonograms and the rules should be fun. We should be playing games. There should be meaningful practice. It should be mixed up and going, you know, at it from this angle and that angle over time. It's also important to prioritize. So often in education these days, we're in such a hurry to get to the higher level subjects. We want to teach all of these concepts um, about history and science and um to get students doing these higher order um, subjects, but we forget that if those students cannot read, every other subject, even math, is going to take longer. So we need to prioritize education. Students who are struggling with reading need time to practice reading. They need focused time every day to practice reading. All the rest except math and reading are extra until a student has really mastered the basics of reading. And then they can begin to practice and depth, um, make their reading comprehension skills um, and practice those skills at a deeper level using the subjects um, and using the material in the other subjects. Another reason many students struggle with learning to read and spell is a learning style mismatch. Um, reading has uh, many different components. There's a visual component to it. And in order to learn to become a good reader, students need to recognize the visual components, the shapes of the letters. And students who are not strong visual um, learners will sometimes or often struggle with ma mastering those visual components of reading. Uh, reading has an auditory component. The auditory component of reading is speaking. In fact, they've shown that strong readers are primarily using the language center, the same center they use for speaking and listening. They're using a little bit of their visual center, but they're primarily using their auditory centers for reading because the, um, the symbols on the page are representing speech. They're representing sounds. And so students who struggle with auditory skills uh, will struggle also with reading. Reading also has a natural kinesthetic component, and we often don't think of that. But the kinesthetic component of reading is writing. And some of the studies that have been done recently in Europe are really fascinating because they've shown that students who learn how to write at the same time they're learning their alphabets and as they're learning their phonograms actually have fewer reversals and they have a longer term memory of those uh, sounds of that alphabet system. And so it's really important that we don't leave out our kinesthetic learners and that we teach writing right from the beginning. Uh, once again, there'll be demonstration videos on the Logic of English um, YouTube channel where you can see demonstrations of how to teach writing in a way that connects to kinesthetic learners and that all students can master. But it's important to take away from this video that we can't leave handwriting instruction behind. Handwriting instruction is a integral component to teaching reading. I think that all teachers, when they are learning about learning styles, should really watch this movie by Temple, uh, about Temple Grandin. Uh, Temple Grandin is an amazing woman. She um, was named uh, one of the 100 most influential people in the world uh, by Time Magazine. Uh, Temple Grandin actually has autism. She uh, is an amazing person in the fact that she is such a visual learner and she's able to communicate how she learns to people uh, in her movie and in her speaking. And in this movie, I think teachers can really gain an understanding and an appreciation for what it's like to be a strong visual learner and to understand that this learning style is really beautiful and really powerful and that it's really important to integrate strong visual learning into our teaching methods of reading. Uh, I also like to tell the story of Jillian Lynn, and in fact, uh, Jillian Lynn's story can be heard on www.ted.com if you search for um, Sir Ken Robinson's presentation, Schools Kill Creativity. In that presentation, Sir Ken Robinson tells um, Jillian Lynn's story, and I like to share it here because it was so influential in my life in understanding um, learning styles and the way that they play into reading instruction and the way they play into instruction as a whole. When Jillian was young, um, her mother brought her to the physician and said that she couldn't sit still, that she was um, not paying attention in class, and that she was really struggling. And the physician said, um, let's step out of the room. I'd like to talk to you about um, her in private. 
And as he stepped out of the room, he switched on the radio and he said, let's watch her for a few moments. And as Ken, Sir Ken Robinson tells, Julian began to dance. And he said, ma'am, there's nothing wrong with your daughter. She's a dancer. Bring her to a dance school. And Jillian said, and this is what changed my life when I heard this line, she said, when I arrived at the dance school, I met people like myself, people who thought through movement. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm not someone who thinks through movement, but what would it be to be someone who thinks through movement? And that is a profound gift. Uh, Jillian Lynn went on to form um, the Jillian and Lynn um, ballet studio. She uh, danced with the Royal Ballet and she has choreographed, um, I believe, Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She has given pleasure to millions and she is a multimillionaire. And if someone had said to her, sit down and be still and not understood her gift, her gift would have been lost to the world. And so this has really shaped how I think about education, um, Temple Grandin, Jillian Lynn, and, and others. Uh, I'm sure there's stories of auditory learners out there, too, who are prof have a profound auditory gift. And what I've come to understand is that we have to teach using all of the learning modes so that all of the students are able to learn in their primary mode, because all students learn faster and deeper with multimodality teaching. Multimodality teaching uses all the learning styles. And it's important that we don't just teach kinesthetic learners using kinesthetic methods, because what we want to do is we want to take their area of strength and use it while building their areas of weakness. And brain research has shown when we use multimodality teaching, students are then using the auditory center, they're using the kinesthetic center, they're using the visual center, and they're building synapses across them, and they're fast, their learning is faster and deeper. So we need to apply this to reading instruction. The way that I do this is uh, through uh, teaching and reading um, through spelling dictation. Um, and in this method, we have students actually hear a word, break it into its individual parts, and then write it down and then analyze the word with their um, instructors. If you'd like to see a, a video example of spelling instruction, you can see one on the Logic of English YouTube channel as well under spelling dictation. And you can begin to, I will step you through how each of those parts plays out into multimodality teaching and its benefits um, for all types of learning styles. Another reason many students struggle with reading and spelling is top-down teaching. We begin with the whole and then we ask the students to figure out the parts. Um, in other words, we ask students to read without explaining the code. We say to them, wow, you're five years old, it's time to learn to read, let's sit down on the sofa together or let's um, pick up a book in the class and you're going to read it. But the students don't really understand how the code works. When we do this, we are asking students to do the work of a linguist for one of the world's most complex languages. Now, I went to the University of Minnesota for my graduate work, and while I was there, I took a linguistics class, and I still remember the day that we were studying Swahili. Swahili is a very uh, regular language, and we were analyzing how it works, and I remember the day this professor, you know, a PhD in linguistics said, isn't it too bad we can't do this with English? English has too many exceptions, and it's not regular. And so here's this uh, gentleman who has a PhD in linguistics, and he didn't know the phonograms and the spelling rules that explain 98% of English words logically. And yet we're asking students to do this on their own when we don't teach them how the code works and teach them systematically. It's a no wonder that 68% of students are struggling with reading in our nation when we're not teaching systematically. It's also important that we respect children's stages of language development. Did you know that babies, um, when they um, begin to babble, babble all the sounds in all the world's languages? And as they babble, um, they begin to then put those sounds together into short one-syllable words, such as ma and pa and cup and me and juice. And then they begin to put those um, short words in together into short sentences, more juice, me cup, and then to build into more and more complex sentences. And we don't realize it, but babies are really systematic language learners. And it's something that they do almost innately. They don't go from not speaking to speaking paragraphs. They go from sounds to short words 
to short phrases and short sentences and then bigger and bigger words and bigger and bigger and longer and more complex sentences. And so we need to follow that same pattern when we're teaching. We need to teach the sounds of the phonograms. Then we need to teach how to blend them into words and then how the words form sentences and then how to read books and read and comprehend. Now, it's very important that we don't torture read. I recently spoke at an elementary school and I was speaking to parents, but there were a number of teachers in the room and they gasped when I told them what, I was, what I'm about to say. But the reality is if we have an older student who's struggling with reading and they've not been taught the rules and phonograms, we need to stop torture reading with them. We need to stop expecting them to be able to read aloud. These students are hurting inside because each time they're needing to read aloud and they're guessing and they're not getting it correct, they're feeling a deep amount of shame and it's torture for them. It's torture for the person listening to them. Rather, it's better to take a break. Stop requiring the student to read aloud. Go back, teach them the rules, teach them the phonograms. You can teach them the rules and phonograms in eight weeks using the Logic of English Essentials program. You can teach them using other programs um, in a very, very short amount of time and then go back to books. And when students have a question about how a word is read, you will then be able to say, to them. This is how the word is read and why, or why is there a silent final E in that word? And they'll be able to look at it and you'll have answers as opposed to constantly saying that's an exception or having to read the words for them. Another reason many students struggle with reading and spelling is boring bottom-up teaching. Now we've all been in classrooms where the teacher drones on and on and on telling us what we're supposed to know and we feel bored and it doesn't sink in. But rather, good teaching guides students to discover what they can on their own and provides support so they cannot fail. When we teach reading, we can teach through discovery. It doesn't need to be that we tell them everything about the rules and phonograms. Rather, we can teach the students in such a way where they discover them. We set it up so that there's experiments they can do and they figure it out. But we set those experiments up with words so they can't fail. Good teaching engages the students. We ask them questions. We lead them. Good teaching inspires. Good teaching is systematic and it is explicit. We don't leave holes because students have different strengths, different weaknesses. We are all like that. There are things that we will figure out quickly, things that we will master quickly, and the same student might get hung up with another concept and struggle with it a little bit more slowly or it just doesn't seem obvious. We need to teach in such a way that all students um, are systematically and explicitly taught how to read. Another reason many older students continue to struggle with reading and spelling is they're very, very cynical. These students have been taught um, that to read in a way that didn't make sense to them, and then they've been told this teacher or this program or this new book or this new method or this new reading specialist is going to solve the problem for you. And maybe they get excited about it and then they try and they're not any better off than before they began, or just a little bit better. So it's really, really important that we respect these students' cynicism. It's really important that we help them to understand that their cynicism is a healthy response to something that hasn't made sense to them. There's a few ways that we can help students who are cynical, though. First of all, do not get struck, dr stuck on just drilling phonograms. Students who are cynical need to see phonograms at work within words. Even if they haven't mastered them, go on and begin to show how they are at work within words. If they misread a phonogram within a word, gently remind them of what sounds it makes. Just continually practice the phonograms within words um, because they may need to see thousands of words. They may need to see that this works consistently across thousands of words before they begin to let go of their cynicism because they've been so frustrated by the exceptions. It's also um, important to apologize to students. I know one of um, my boys was still struggling um, what happened with my sons is, you know, I explained that we used a phonics program where there was a lot of inconsistencies and it didn't teach a systematic phonics. It taught an impartial phonics and they were very confused by that. And at the end of um, kindergarten and first grade, they still couldn't read. 
And then I began to discover uh, the Orton-Gillingham method. And one of the boys really took off very quickly, just overnight, began to read chapter books, like within about two or three months. And the other son continued to struggle. So at the beginning of third grade, he still wasn't reading. And that's when I learned about um, directionality. I learned that he had a lot of visual confusion issues. He was sitting across the table from siblings doing schoolwork. I was teaching at a 90 degree angle and I wasn't being really consistent. I wasn't practicing with him every single day. And so I went to him um, one evening and I we were washing dishes and I just said, you know, this has been really hard for you. I, I can see that, you know, I taught you how to read one way and now I'm switching the method and I'm teaching a new way. That must be confusing. And he said, yeah, it has been confusing. And I talked to him about, you know, some of the visual confusions. And I just said, you know, I'm really sorry. And I want you to know and that this isn't your fault, that I didn't know how to teach you in a way that made sense to you. And he walked out of that room as if a thousand pounds had been taken off his shoulder. Now, I want to be careful, though, because teachers and parents, you know, we want children to learn how to read. And I'm not saying that you take that weight of guilt and you put it on your shoulders. Rather, we cannot teach what we do not know. And so we need to just accept that if this presentation is presenting new information to us, it's not a chance to feel guilty. It's an opportunity to change what we do um, in order to help our students. It's also important that we affirm their struggle. Sometimes the older students who are struggling the most, I'll show them words like have and say, isn't it crazy that doesn't say have? And then I'll immediately say, you know what? No wonder you're confused because that generates a lot of exceptions. And in fact, you were right. You've observed some things about this language. But did you know what? English words don't end in V. And that's why there's a silent E there. And I have discovered rules that can explain 98% of English words. And I think this might really help because I can see that this has been really hard and really confusing for you. So really empathize with the students. Another reason many students struggle with reading and spelling is disrespect and misunderstanding. There can be students uh, where, the ch where the child is you know, having a reading lesson and they're upside down, they're falling off their chair, they need to move, and, um, or they're just really struggling. And so one of the things I like to remind teachers and parents is children need to move. Sometimes we expect young children to sit quietly for too long. Um, or we don't understand that a kinesthetic learner needs to be active while they're learning, and we're not playing active learning games. Um, I really believe that it's important that we understand that children's uh, minds get full. Uh, if you're at a seminar all day long, you'll notice that you start to get tired after lunch or you, that you get to t get tired after taking in so much information and that you would be better off if you got up and moved around or if you did something different for a while and then came back to it. So it's important that we respect our students who are kinesthetic. It's important that we give students a break, that we respect their learning styles and teach in a multimodality way and that we um, respect uh, attention spans of students. So once again, when children's minds get full, give them a break and don't keep push pushing. Also, sometimes children who don't understand are actually feeling shame. They feel shame that they don't get it and they think everybody else around them does or that everybody else gets it and there's something wrong with them. And then we interpret the student as being disrespectful, um, being um, disruptive, and we discipline them. So it's important to try to discern if the student who is misbehaving or struggling is really acting out of um, not understanding and needing to approach reading and spelling in a new way. Also, many times we expect students to have the same learning style as the teacher. In fact, I'm pretty convinced that most people who go into education are some balance of visual and auditory learners who really just get reading and education um, on that level, and that's why they loved school. Um, and we need to understand that not all students are that way, and that we need to begin to understand those other learning styles and be able to work in a way that makes sense to those students, and understand that those learning styles are gifts, gifts academically, as well as gifts to our society. 
sometimes it's also the child who's being disrespectful and it's very, very difficult to tell because sometimes it's the child who needs to be told, you know what, you do need to focus on this activity for five or 10 minutes and then we're going to do this other activity. But until then, you can sit over here and you can wait until you're ready to do it um, and to be focused. It's also important to know what motivates your students. Um, as a homeschool parent, I've actually been learning a great deal more about this than I learned uh, when I was in the classroom because I've been working so much more one-on-one -on -one with students, both my own and then the students that I tutor. I know that I have one child, when I tell him it's too hard, he goes, yeah, you're right, it is too hard. I'll never be able to do that. But if I tell him, you can do this, you're able to do this, he feels more hopeful. I have another child who, if I say that's too hard, um, she goes, oh, well, then it must not be interesting, and she's totally not engaged. But if I say, you know what, this is going to be so hard, I don't think you can do it. She'll be like, yes, I can. I can do that. And thinking that it's too hard is going to be exactly what motivates her. Some kids are motivated by games. Others are motivated by the idea that if you finish this and um, do it well and have um, a good attitude and good focus during it, then you could go outside for an extra five minutes of playtime today or 10 minutes. So really try to figure out what motivates um, your student and your students. Also remember, good teaching first inspires. We need to be excited about what we're teaching. When we learn the phonograms and rules, many teachers become really interested in words, and that inspiration passes off to their students. But also be free to use rewards and to use consequences. Some students are motiv motivated by rewards, some are motivated by consequences, and try to, um, to use both in your classroom. But first, develop a passion for your subject develop a passion for words and for teaching and reading. Now, I really want to take a moment and talk about broken hearts. Um, many students who struggle with reading and spelling are not only cynical, they're heartbroken, especially students who have been failing year after year after year at the most foundational subject to all of education. So teaching uh, older student to read, the actual mechanics of how the language work is, works is actually not the most difficult part. The most difficult part with struggling learners is addressing the heart and freeing them from shame. And it's really important um, to protect students from broken hearts as well. Uh, this applies to um, all of our students. It's important that we understand that logical and literal students who have been told the wrong information often internalize it as if something is wrong with them. Yet these logical and literal students are brilliant. They're our nation's future scientists and engineers. They may have the cure of cancer, um, the ability to cure cancer inside of them, but if they don't learn to read and if they're given a message somehow that um, there's something wrong with them because they're looking for rules, they're looking for a system, they're looking for how things work and exceptions grate on them. Um, these students will become heartbroken, not just about reading, but about education. Many strong auditory, kinesthetic, or visual learners who are not taught systematically and not taught in a multisensory way that uses auditory, visual, and kinesthetic connections really struggle. And yet these children and these students have amazing gifts to offer the world because of their strong um, gifts in these particular learning styles. Um, lack of consistency and misunderstandings about how to achieve deep learning often results in students becoming brokenhearted. They think there's something wrong with them when they were taught it on Monday and they don't know it on Thursday and there was no practice in between. But really, learning is a process of learning and forgetting, learning and forgetting, and it takes consistent practice over time. These students need to be taught, you know, short periods of time every single day over a period of years and to work on reading instruction. And if they're older students um, who are struggling with reading, it's great to take aside time, maybe two or three hours a day, and really focus on mastering reading instruction over the course of um, eight weeks or 12 weeks so that they can then begin to achieve mastery and not be discouraged because the problem is that they weren't taught consistently. 
Many students also are struggling with broken relationships, broken relationships with their teachers and with their parents. And what I have learned is, as a teacher and as a parent with learners who have struggled is that if I open myself to the questions of my struggling students, I will learn more about my subject than if I ignored those or if I said that it was their fault or it was something that was wrong with um, how they're processing information. Rather, it is my struggling students students who have taught me the most about English. It is my struggling students who are the inspiration for the book Uncovering the Logic of English and for the Essentials curriculum. And if we allow these students into our hearts and, and to really open up relationally with them, they will teach us more than any of our other students. If you'd like more information on reading and spelling education, you can visit the website www.logicofenglish.com. You can also find uh, more videos on the Logic of English YouTube channel to help um, you with reading and spelling instruction.